Um, well, thanks for joining us on the After Halloween Morning. Uh, my name is Juliana Bahan, and I coordinate monthly PD activities for EL practitioners at English Online. Uh, for our first session today, we invited Elena uh, Maggio to present on Google as a toolbox for EL teachers. At English Online, we have known Elena as a part of advisory committee Passionati team, and she is of a great support for us in organizing Realize Forum. Elena works for Link Home Study at the Center for Education and Training in Ontario, uh, where she facilitates online teacher training and professional development for EL practitioners. She kindly agreed to do a webinar for us to share her extensive knowledge, experience, and passion for meaningful use of technology for language learning. And please join me in welcoming Elena to this session today. I will pull up your slides. And Yes, Tyson, I, I've received the invitation, taking it to heart, certainly. Jessica contacted me the other day about it. All right, welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to share my Saturday morning with you, um, welping, welcoming you to my home, but not having to worry about the dirty dishes in my sink. Um, so today's session really is about a broad perspective of Google, with regards to um, teaching and teaching practices and some tools that it could offer to you to make your lives um, a little bit more manageable and um, certainly a little bit more interesting when it comes to instruction. So today's session is going to take a look at um, a broad spectrum of tools and hopefully a few of those kind of sink their hooks into you and you're interested in exploring them for your professional or potentially personal life beyond today's session. So when we look at Google and some of the benefits that I've found in the use of some ser services and tools offered by Google, it's free access to online services, many of which you don't need an account for. So we'll take a look at some of the options which require an account to be set up and some options that are free to use without any login or account setup required. There are a variety of tools which you can access should you have an account. It's seamless integration between different tools, different sites with one login permission. So there is no difference between accessing my data from my work computer, from my cell phone, or from my home computer. So it's seamless, it's synchronous. That speaks to the next part of data portability. You no longer have to rely on hard copies or your hard drive to access your lessons, your reports, your files, you can access regardless of the system or the equipment you're using. There is very easy collaboration with others. I use Google services collaboratively on a routine basis, both in my outside life, beyond work, but also within my work, daily life at work. We do incorporate Google services quite frequently and for those who persist and experiment with them, you really can integrate efficiencies into your workday by leveraging many of these services. And they're free, which is a benefit to administrators and offices who don't have to go out and purchase software. Um, so apps and services uh, can certainly facilitate learning, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So they go across skills. You can identify tools within the spectrum of Google services that will help you and your students learn online together. So the focus of much of my uh, discussion today will be helping teachers in a distance education or blended environment, but it's the integration of that technology that will help facilitate learning, but also the administration of that learning. 
And hopefully, from one side or the other, you'll find a practice or a, a tool that will help you with either the instruction or the administration, or the hope is both, eventually. And one of the benefits of using many of the services that we can talk about today is that your students are aware either through exposure or through explicit use of many of these tools. So they, they're, they can sort of be scaffolded. They have an understanding of Google as a whole. They're, they likely have understanding of Google as a search engine or YouTube. So you can integrate practices in, into your teaching without having to invest a lot of time in setting up their digital literacy, their understanding of these services, or how to access um, some of the tools that you would like to use. So those are some, for me, identified benefits. Now, I'm going to move on to my next slide and hopefully rely on all of you to contribute using chat. So I hope throughout this session to receive questions, to get requests for clarification, but also to have you share your own practices. Because with everyone in the room, we all have experience and skills, I am certain, can benefit each other. So when we look at Google as a whole and some of the ways that you use it, both in your daily life, professionally or personally, how do you use Google? So before looking explicitly at some of the tools, what are your thoughts on the use of Google in your everyday life? So what, how do you use it? I'm pretty sure I have one answer. Since Google is now a verb, how do you use Google? Drive, fabulous. Yep, so you Google on the Google search engine. Uh, the docs, calendar, images, excellent. I'm going to get into all of those, searching and planning. Yep, so um, collaborating. I can't wait to hear about the collaboration that's going on. Yeah, so I, all of those, excellent. So we do have um, the, uh, I guess the main function that we're most familiar with in terms of Google services is Google search, the search engine. But we do have options within the search engine such as images, and we do have collaborative tools such as the calendar and Google Docs. So we're going to take a look at these services and these tools, and I'd like to get a sense of how you're using the tools. So maybe I can identify some options or our best practices within these tools that might help you. So for me, I no longer teach students. I teach teachers, and I work in administration. So a lot of the focus on my use of Google is in the administrative or teacher instruction realm. For you, um, if you want me to stop and take a look at explicit teaching practices, if you'd like me to stop and maybe take a look at some more administrative uses of these tools, please stop me, ask questions, let me know where you want the focus to go so that you receive the most benefit from today's discussion. So one thing that I want to warn you about is that this is huge. This is a universe of technology and skills and applications, and I don't want you to get lost in this entire dialogue. What I try to um, communicate to teachers is that you don't have to use everything. You don't have to be interested in everything. You have to start with the baby steps. You have to explore something. And once you get a handle on that, then it's quite easy to start kind of flowing into the other options that you might be exposed to today. But don't be overwhelmed, and don't be overwhelmed to a point where it's information overload and you simply stop um, being curious about Google. Stick to something, stick to something you would enjoy practicing and experimenting with, and consider other options later on in your development. One way to do that for people who don't have a Google account 
is set up a fake account, a dummy account. And there is no loss and no risk when you do that. So when you're exploring these tools and you don't want to um, fix your digital identity to a specific tool, create a fake one. So I have, I have a fake identity online where I open accounts and I go in and I play and I see if I like it before committing myself to that online presence. And if it makes you more comfortable saving or protecting your privacy or your data, I recommend if you want to experiment, you go in, create something silly and fake, see if you like it from the inside out, and then if you do, then at that point, consider the next steps in terms of setting up that practice professionally. So don't get lost in too much of the detail. Focus on what will support your instruction, motivate you, and help you towards your own professional development. I, I'm going to sort of overlap much of the tools we look at between this, the fun stuff that I like to do on my own and the serious stuff that I can do with my students or I could do at work. So you can take what you want from this, either that sounds interesting just to do with my kids or just to do to set up my music library, or this is a really good idea to practice competency for listening benchmark five. You can go to that micro level of detail or you can take it more broadly and apply it more liberally to your, to your general technology use. So in the end, you will look at tools to stay connected, engaged, and organized. And the uh, experience I've had in distance education, each of these is a challenge. To stay connected, engaged, and organized efficiently and effectively and consistently um, tends to be the hiccup. We fall into very set practices. We don't have the skill or exposure to these tools in a practical way. And our students are sort of technophobic. They don't, at times, engage in technology willingly or effectively. And we have to draw them into that world. As distance education teachers, that's the challenge we have for ourselves. That's the challenge we have to pose to our students because it's not going anywhere. Technology is here. We have these tools. Let's sit down and make a conscious effort of applying them effectively or finding those practices that will allow us to be effective education teachers or education um, professionals online. So this, these are, this is the umbrella of Google. These are the things that we're looking at when we talk about Google services. And they can be divided into, I guess, a quadrant of four sections. Web services, media services, home and office services, and social services. So from this list, you will likely recognize many of the names that I've presented. So Google search is that I, what we've identified um, the search engine. We also have a browser, so Chrome. Those of you who use Internet Explorer, Safari, uh, Mozilla Firefox, Opera, Chrome is within that family of browsers. You do have Google Toolbar. I still have to stumble upon the person who uses this frequently, but hey, I'm sure they're out there. You have Google Media options, YouTube, um, endemic. It's everywhere. Everyone knows YouTube. Whether or not you're content creators or simply content viewers usually is the question whether or not you have an account or simply go on to the YouTube.com website to watch. That's the threshold. Google Images was mentioned, so you do have options within the Google search engine to search videos, news, images, um, websites, etc. You have Google Video. You have Picasa, so all of you who have an artistic flair with images or, or pictures, you can create an account with Picasa and go in and do some photo editing. Google Maps, the only way that I can navigate my world is by Google Maps. I'm certainly not a Magellan, and this service helps a lot of um, people. 
you have then the Google, the Google Home and Office Suite. And this is what was mentioned as well in terms of some of the services that you have in practice. You have Google Drive, Google Calendar was mentioned, Gmail, certainly. Um, I'll take a look at some efficiencies within Gmail that you can try and experiment with. You have Google Translate. As a tool for students, this, for me, for lower level, uh, those at a stage one, even literacy, where they re require L1, um, in, or not require, but it's easier to use their L1 to, to teach, even for seniors learning English, sometimes use of L1 is recommended. That's where Google Translate can help, because I don't speak Spanish. I might need some support in terms of instructions with my very low level students. There is Google Talk. I'll mention Google Talk because I don't have a landline. The only phone I have is this computer here. Um, and Google Pr Cloud Print. So efficiencies for your home and office practices. And then you have the social side of Google. You have Google Hangouts. You have Blogger. I, I don't know if you're familiar with Blogger from the inside because you're, you blog. But I hope that you would have at least heard the phrase or the word blogger. You have Google Groups, which are sort of forums that create threaded discussion within Google. And you have Google+. Plus. Now, if you look broadly at all of this, one account accesses all of them. So I'm going to let my nerd flag, shy, uh, nerd flag fly and say, for all of you who are familiar with Lord of the Rings, one ring to rule them all one account to rule them all. You just have to open one and you have access to all of these services for free. So I like free things. If I can get it for free, I won't pay for it. And that's why a lot of people use Google Drive, for example. Um, you don't have to purchase the Microsoft Office Suite to create a document any longer or to make that document accessible to others in a, in a compatible format. So we're going to take a look at some of these services. Um, we'll talk about the services very quickly, the ones that don't require an account. And these are quite um, simple because you are likely to have been exposed to them either through experience or use previously. So many of you mentioned Google search. Of course, there is Google search. And when it enters our lexicon, when it's in the Oxford Dictionary, it's here. So to Google is to look within that search bar for a website or information online for your search inquiry. Uh, there is Chrome. So I don't know from our uh, audience today how many of you use Chrome versus the other search engines. Um, can I get a, just in the chat how many of you use Chrome by saying yes or by entering Chrome? Or if you use IE? Internet Explorer. <clears throat> so those who like Chrome feel that it's faster than other browsers. Um, Chrome and Firefox, so combination of both. Certainly, I use that too. Um, yep, some, some people do think it's faster. And I like Chrome because you can customize and you can integrate a lot of apps. So we'll get into why some people do like downloading Chrome. But it's very easy to use, and it's fun, and it's current. You have Google Toolbar, don't need an account. Um, yeah, I, Tyson, I agree. I do the same thing. Uh, Chrome is one of the tools that I use to navigate these other services. Extensions, fabulous, absolutely. Extensions are wonderful, too. For everyone who's not familiar, we will get to that uh, momentarily. Then you have YouTube. Um, you might be YouTube sensations, you all might be YouTube stars, or you might be uh, YouTube users who log on to watch funny cat videos or just watch television even sometimes. And then you have the image and video search. So when you look at this list of tools, you do not need obviously an account to access them. Each of you are able to go in and open your browser and use Chrome without logging in if you don't have an account. You can obviously use YouTube. You can search for images. Um, but one of the things that you should be aware of is that you're provided with the use of these tools, but in a limited way. If you can 
open that window and look inside and see how many other services you can pull from Chrome or from YouTube or from the video search. If you can open that and see from the inside with an account the additional options, it's a very small threshold to pass for a lot of benefit. So we'll take a look first at Google Images. Now I'm going to pull out from my library my beautiful, beautiful um, collection of National Geographic images. And one of my tasks, I used to have tons of these, just tons of them. One of my obviously favorite uh, activities was to get students to write, I would use image prompts. That's not a surprise to any teacher. I'm sure many of you are using same, the same practices. So I would go in and I'd say, write a story. Tell me who is she. Tell me her story. What is she doing? Where is she from? Or even basic adjectives. Describe the picture. So now as teachers, you're working online and you're not sending your students pictures by mail. You are not sending them um, images that you've torn out of your grandparents' old National Geographics from in the basement like I did. You have an online option and you have options within Google Images to find images that you can leverage in your instruction. So you're not ripping apart all your magazines or books anymore. You're pulling things from online. So you have options to share based on color, based on file type, based on usage rights. We'll take a look at this because not everyone is aware that you can filter images based on usage, copyright restriction. You can also find images based on dimension and image type. So if you don't want to take a photograph, you want to find clip art that illustrates verbs. So clip art that says jump, clip art that says um, fall. You can find images based on the type. Obviously, there are different uses. So you can use as discussion prompts, theme-based lessons. So you want to embed an image in a handout. You can certainly use it for vocabulary development. So pull different types of fruit plop it onto a, 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 a digital file and send it to a student. And you can also use Im these images for classroom publications. So pull together all of your students' writing and issue a digital magazine, potentially. So let's just take a look at one of the options with uh, Google Images for usage rights. So when you go in and you uh, use advanced search options, you can search by size by aspect, the ratios, the pixelation, the color. So you can look full color, black and white, or you can look for every yellow image. Um, you can look within a region. You can look for format, so it's JPEG or GIF. And then here you can look for usage rights. So when you go and make a, a, do an image search within Google Images, you can search for rights. So if you want Creative Commons copyright free, you're not going to get dinged by infringing copyright. You can go set your, set your restrictions so that you're searching for every red, red image that has um, free copyright. As teachers, it might be a useful uh, option for you when you're trying to find images that you are confident you are allowed to include in your teaching. So let's move on to YouTube because YouTube is another media option. So instead of a still non-moving image, you have video images. You all, I'm sure, have logged on or gone to YouTube, watched a, um, a movie or a video clip, but you can also post. You can also find ESL channels online. So there are lots of um, professionals who go online and record their ESL class. They're talking about subjunctives. They're talking about gerund. They're in front of a whiteboard writing their lesson out. You can send those clips to students. You can access YouTube from any device. So I have my cell phone. I can log on and watch videos on my cell. You can create an account and open a playlist. So this is something that I do. I'll show you later on how it's set up. But you can have a playlist for your students. So instead of sending them an email with a, a YouTube video link every week, you can send them a link to your playlist once and tell them to return to your playlist later on. So you're not resending email after email on a routine basis. 
you're giving them the page where your videos are saved or your video, your video library is saved and you share that with them at one time and then never have to worry about it again. You can watch videos synchronously online. So if I refer to Google Hangouts initially, and you can, in Google Hangouts, watch videos synchronously. So for those of us solely in distance ed, I'm watching a YouTube video on my computer. My student in Halifax is watching the same video. We're logged on together. If I type, they see it. If I pause the, the video, they have it paused. If they pause, I see a pause. So you're watching it together and you're watching it synchronously. Great practical application for listening, obviously. So tell me what language function you heard. Um, tell me the pragmatics. How did that person politely decline an invitation? Immediately right during your class. You can customize privacy settings. So if you are a content creator and you've shared your video, um, I have videos on YouTube. I hope you will never find them. Um, not that they're bad, but in, in a bad way, but they're not professionally made. But you probably can't find them because I've not tagged any of them. So you can protect privacy, determining who you want to see that video and who will never see that video, or keep them entirely private and no one ever sees the video, except the execs at YouTube if they're really that sleepless one night. Um, and then you can discover other YouTube channels based on re recommendations of other users. So this is how I usually find some great music. I will log on, find a wonderful video that I absolutely love, and I would just like scan the recommendations along the page to see if there are any other videos based on a common interest or a common preference that other users are recommending or that other users have in their playlist. I have found so much wonderful music that way and I recommend that you can find ESL videos that way. So you can create playlists and for me this is what my playlist looks like. I have music videos and this is from my, my personal option. So when I create a playlist, all I do when I'm at home and I don't like anything on the radio, I've created my playlist I press, press play and I have four hours of music nonstop. I've never purchased a single of this, one of these songs other than what I might have on my iPod. So when you create a playlist, I can have a dinner party and have six hours of nonstop music that plays through um, my YouTube channel. So, and I've organized to different types of moods. Now you can do this with um, different types of playlists. So you can do this obviously with an ESL channel. You can have a student who has a playlist or you share your playlist with your student all grammar explanations. You can have another playlist for vocabulary development. So you, I'm, I use it more, more often for professional purposes but you can create a playlist for, um, for private purposes but you can create a playlist for professional purposes. And when you've done that, it's really a matter of sending one hyperlink to whomever you want to share your list with, and they access it. And once you upload a new song to your playlist, you don't have to notify anybody, you don't have to send another link, they get that new video with their prior link. They don't have to do anything different. Um, so here we have a few options for English. So I'm not, I'm going to move away from all of my lovely yoga videos or the music that I like to listen to and return to teaching and say there are lots of English videos online. Ingved was, um, Ingved was one mentioned. Natalia, I believe, said it. But when you have access to this um, presentation later on, simply click on the hyperlink here and you can go to some of these video sites and they're playlists. So what you do is you have lots and lots and lots of videos that you can share with your students that are focused on language development. So that's some of the uses of YouTube. Any questions so far? What I have talked about 
Um, the benefits, explicit benefits, are when you have a YouTube account. By YouTube account, it's simply creating a, a, an account with a username and password. As simple as can be. Um, but the added benefits of YouTube come when you open the door and you step inside with an account. So if there are no questions, I'll move on. And I'll talk about Chrome as a browser. Now, um, we had a little bit of a discussion already about how, how many of you use Chrome. It is a web browser. It's compatible with devices and smartphones. It allows you to have themes and apps and extensions. So by that, there are tools within Chrome that make life easier. And I'll show you some of the apps or extensions that I have within my Chrome account. Um, you can have full access to all services when you have a Google account. So if you have a Google account, you can log on to Chrome without a problem. It also allows you to browse incognito, so it does it doesn't save cookies and it doesn't save browser history. So if you're worried about logging on to your Chrome, your Chrome account from work, you can disable a browsing history. Just a, an option if that's something that worries you. So Chrome apps, they're applications that offer services that could be used for business, school, or personal use. They help you customize Chrome. So it's not this blank page that you have to then launch into other services from with a lot of different bookmarks, a lot of different websites that you kind of have to touch in different places. Chrome allows you to pull all that into one place. And a lot of the options that are available to you can be used for communication, all of those lovely things we said, communication, collaboration, and engagement. So we'll take a look at some of the options that I have. So this is my Chrome account. You can see here my name's in the corner, which means I'm logged in as a user. And from this one place, my dashboard, I can launch all of these tools. I don't have to scroll through my bookmarks. I don't have to um, open a different website. Those of you who have a smartphone, this looks very intuitive. This is what your smartphone looks like when you're um, sliding through all of your apps. One place gives everything to you from one interface. So if you like QR codes, I can access my drive. I can access my Gmail. I can access um, some of the Office Suite tools that I use, converting documents to or from PDF. So again, those of you who are familiar with a smart world or smartphone environment know what this feels like in terms of ease of access. And if you want to log on to this from your work computer or from your home computer, you can do that without any loss of accessibility or data. So if I, when I'm at work, I get this page. When I'm at home, I get this page. I don't have to worry that I have a bookmark saved on my home computer. I can't access that content. Darn it, I wanted to use it in my class today. You don't have to worry about that. It's there, um, and it's seamless. Access is seamless and synchronized from any computer. How do you find the fun stuff? You go to the web store. So the app store, um, that small icon I've circled in the top left, that's where you would go into this world of the applications and extensions and pick and choose, like um, a farmer in an orchard, take that fruit and just enjoy it. So this is what it would look like when you enter the App Store. And you would have all of your options listed in terms of themes. So I'm, I've now circled here. You can't see it clearly, but it's the section that focuses on educational applications. Educational applications that you can also identify um, for language learners. So even within the, the, these options of educational apps, you have apps that are focused on English language learners. You have apps that are focused on uh, language learners in general. So when you want to customize Chrome for your teaching purposes, you have that option. If students want to customize Chrome for their learning, if they want to find um, a text-to-speech app to help them with their pronunciation, 
then they can go in and launch an app where they can visit a website within Chrome and have the site or have this app speak the site to them. So there are options within Chrome if you customize that will help you manage your, your data, make it accessible, and um, help your students learn because there are tools that will help them become more proficient in computer use, such as typing, but also in uh, learning English uh, through different listening, uh, listening options, vocabulary development options, grammatical apps that help students explore the grammar of a web page, etc. So I'm going to go on to Gmail, and I want to maybe hear from you again. How many of you have a Gmail account? So how many of you use Gmail? If you have Gmail, then you can access any of these services. If you don't have Gmail, then practice, create a fake account if, you, if you're interested. But it's lots and lots and lots of storage. It's mobile access. Um, we'll get you on board, Jen. We'll get you with a, a Gmail account. By the end of this, we'll get you in with um, some fake name and you'll be exploring it. But you have um, mobile access. You can customize themes. You can add filters. You can call cell phones. You can import other accounts. Um, there's a search fin feature. You can sync it with other devices uh, or other um, services. And you can create a PDF of a conversation. Now, why are some of these things mentioned here? Because they make my life so much easier, and they could likely make your life easier as well. One that I want to focus on is importing other email accounts. You'd be frightened to know how many email accounts I have. It frightens myself. I have at least seven email accounts. Um, it's like I'm, I'm likely to see if you disclose how many email accounts you have a lot. So you, most people have more than one. Gmail allows, yeah, you go five, there you go. Gmail allows you to take all of your email accounts and pulls it into one inbox. So what I have set up on my Gmail account is all of my emails from all of my seven different accounts or more come to one inbox. One login, one option to filter, to read. It's excellent. So teachers who have you know, the work email, their private emails, you can funnel that all into one account. And it's about time management. It's about efficient use of the time that you have. If you need to routinely or even not routinely log on to your accounts, but you have lots of different ones, import to one place. Creating a PDF of an email conversation, to me, is an excellent idea for teachers who do work online exclusively, but are required to keep student portfolios. So our teachers in our program, for example, um, do a lot of their teaching and learning via email. So they'll send a student an assignment by email, student writes back, the content of that email is the assignment. How do I now as a teacher who needs to put together a portfolio condense all of this year of correspondence into one document that I can present in a portfolio? Google does it for you. Create the conversation thread as a PDF document, save it. Enter it into the portfolio. So even that draft process, that process of brainstorming, of first draft, second draft, final draft, you can create that in one email thread back and forth over a series of days, months, and then save that final process as one document as a PDF. For use in portfolio development, especially for the teachers who do work asynchronously. Um, it would allow you to create more effective file systems in terms of portfolio keeping. So I just want to draw your access to the inside of Google accounts if you don't have one. Here we have my Google account. And if you take a look at the kind of dashboard at the top right, you can access every single service from one place. And this will return in different permeations throughout the rest of this presentation or throughout the rest of your navigation in, within Google. So when you have an account, all you have to do is access the toolbox at the top to 
dive into any of the other tools that you have within Google. For some, this is frightening. For some, it's not. I'm not frightened at all. Go explore. If you don't want to share data yet because you still have hesitation, then open a fake account, see what it looks like. But from this place, I can launch my Google+, Plus. I can launch my YouTube, I can launch my Drive. It's seamless. So this applies to every computer I access my Gmail account from. I can go to work, I can here, come home, access it, access from a friend's house, access from my smartphone. This is the place where you would customize your Google account. So here you would go through these options. It is a bit um, blurry, but hopefully you're excited enough to log on after I finish discussing this today and check out how you can customize Google. It's from this place here where you can merge your accounts. It's from this place where you can set up the cute little themes it's also from this place where you can um, set up alerts, you can set up your, your signature. You just change things around so that it works for you as the, as the user. Not everything works for everybody, but if you find those tools that make your life easier, then use them. Don't, um, don't forego exploring these options because you don't have time because in the end, it's likely going to save time if you find something that's useful to you. One thing I want to draw your attention to, and this is also something that our teachers re refer to quite frequently, from within Gmail, I can make calls, free calls to phones. So I don't have a, I don't have a home phone. I'm one of those new generation of people who don't have a landline. I only have a cell phone. And um, there are others who are like that, who have Skype subscriptions. So this is similar VoIP, computer to phone, computer to landline technology. But Skype makes you pay. So as I mentioned, I like everything that's free and easy to use. And this is one option that is both free and easy to use. Within Google Talk, you, are, you can, within Canada and the United States, make calls to landlines for free. I simply click on a little green phone handset beside my Google image, and up pops a dialer. This dialer, I then enter a phone number, and the call connects to any phone, cell phone, landline, whatever the case is, all for free. So for those of you who are familiar with Skype or use Skype or have a Skype account, it's a minimal cost for sure, but if my cell phone wasn't working one day, I'd be in trouble because I don't have a phone. Otherwise, I have neighbors, um, but I don't want to make a nuisance of myself. So if my cell phone isn't working and I still need to make a call, I'd log on to my Google account and I'm able to phone whomever I wished to speak to for free and no need to set up a Skype account. So one feature that is pretty nifty about this, whenever the person sees the caller, it's me, but it's routed through California. So that's just an interesting note if people are expecting um, Hollywood to be calling them about their movie option. It's going to be you, not Hollywood, unfortunately. So I'm going to move on to some file keeping options within Google Drive. And um, I'd like just a sense of what your office looks like. If you're sitting at home in your office, is it stately and organized, such as this beautiful, beautiful room here? Yes or no? Probably no. And what else is in my, <laughs> so do I, I wish as well. What else is in my beautiful office is this, these books, these beautiful, thick poems. My nephews will probably never know what this feels like to own one of these, um, to feel it, to hold it other than when they come to visit me. Um, and it's likely that you will experience the same thing moving forward because our offices are becoming digital. Our files are going online. Natalia, come over. You can lift all of my books if you want. Smell them. Um, so we're all going online. And books, we no longer use them like we did, as frequently or as extensively. We talked about Google, Google searches. 
no one knows Encyclopedia Britannica anymore. Your office is moving in this direction too. And this is how you're going to do it, Google Drive. Google Drive allows you to take all of this and put it online. But one of the great things about this, not to say that I will not um, miss these books, is that it, it took a lot to cart these books to university in a backpack. It takes a lot for your students to take a textbook or a workbook and take transit with it and to um, always have to be weighed down by it. One of the beautiful things, just as Tyson has noted, is that it's transportable. These digital files are light. You can access them. You don't have to worry about losing them. You don't have to worry about um, any um, accessibility issues. If you forgot a book or if you forgot a lesson or if you got, forgot a paper, it's there and you can access it. Um, so you have mobile access. You can create document spreadsheets, presentations, forms, and diagrams. For those of you who are still restricted to Word, Doc, or DocX, this is a whole new world of no longer needing those very prescribed software programs. You can collaborate with others. You have materials. Um, you can, if you still need to use Doc or DocX, it's, comp it's compatible. So you can save documents with, created within Drive as Docs or DocX. You can save them as PowerPoints. You can save as PDFs. So you're not restricted in the file format. And one of the things that was very um, uh, useful for me when using this system was that I no longer had to worry that my students didn't have the software. So computers now don't come with embedded uh, Word suite, uh, Office suite, which makes it difficult if my students have bought an economical computer with stripped down of the software, the fancy stuff, then if I send them a handout in Word, they can't open it. And that's not a good use of my time in creating that resource. It's not a good way for my student because now they're limited in terms of the materials that I can offer them. So Google Drive eliminates that. It's accessibility. Again, I'm returning to this word, accessibility. It's very important. Um, you can track revision history. So those who, are, who, who go through a writing process through brainstorming to final version, you can see, you can view, you can monitor edits and revisions. And you can see who, if you're working on a collaborative writing task, who created those edits or revisions or changes. And you can access existing templates. So you have lots of teachers in this community who've uploaded lesson plan templates, who've uploaded um, record keeping gradebook templates. So you can access other people's lovely and beautiful work um, without having to invest too much time creating those templates on your own. So this is how our lovely group of um, mad scientist teachers use Google Drive. You can create class handouts. You can create forms. Um, our teachers are now using Google Drive for portfolios, for their portfolio and for student portfolios. Our teachers are using Google Forms for needs assessment, for student self-assessment every quarter. They're using Google Forms for listening activities and they're using Google Forms for reading activities. Um, and Google Docs are, can also be used for collaborative writing. So if I'm at the computer with my student at the same time, they're writing something on that same document, I can view it. Um, if I write the correction, then they can view it. So this is kind of um, the test. This is the, the laboratory where our teachers are experimenting with the use of collaborative tools in their teaching, which makes learning and teaching efficient and effective and more motivating because it's moving away from very old practices, old practices into new practices. And I'm going to show you something. This is my teacher portfolio from 2007. I would never do this in 2014. I pulled this off and dusted it because my t teacher portfolio is digital. 
in order for me to get this to a prospective employer, I had to sit at their desk and plop it onto their desk. Now, if I wanted to send a portfolio to a prospective employer, I don't even have to meet them. I don't have to even say hello and face-to-face -face shake a hand. That barrier is eliminated if I send a portfolio in my resume and cover letter electronically. So they can see my teaching. They can see my practices, my philosophy before entering the door. That barrier of saying, hi, this is me, I'm a great teacher, look at my work, is actually put before the, the interview. So for those of you who are interested in the use of Google Drive for things beyond classroom um, practices, consider that you should start navigating, or sorry, start saving your um, digital files in one place where you can easily share portfolio online. So this is an example of Google Forms used for assessment. So a teacher, this is a sample that I've created that I will give you access to here via this hyperlink. Um, the form includes a YouTube video. You embed a video. You create a series of questions. And you send this hyperlink to your student. They complete the form or the quiz or the task. And those answers, the, re the result of that, of that exercise is sent to your Google account. So teachers can create a whole series of listening and uh, reading exercises based on online resources that are benchmarked. So we'll always refer to your CCLB document. And you can create tasks that you send to students digitally with a hyperlink. So then now, instead of emailing an attachment, waiting for the student to complete the document, worrying whether or not they have Office Suite, they save it on their computer, attach it to your email, you correct it, you give feedback in another email, eliminate every one of those little steps. You send a hyperlink, they open an attachment, or they open the hyperlink, they complete the exercise, and then you receive the answers to that task immediately in the format of a spreadsheet. So maybe one day I'll be invited back to show you how to create a Google form and to manage them. But go in, explore, expose yourself to this, experiment with it. But for those of us in a strictly distance digital educational system, this is one way to embed efficiencies into your practice that you will absolutely save tears and time without question. So this is another example. This, our teachers send um, self-assessments. You can send self-assessments quarterly. You can send a, um, a needs assessment at the very beginning of your classes. You create a form. You create um, a different type of um, form versus the one we saw initially. And this takes the can-do statements, adds them to this place where the students click on a hyperlink, and the student is asked to routinely go through their can-do statements every quarter, every month, whatever schedule you have them on. And the result of their reflection is saved on your spreadsheet. So our teachers, many of them, have embedded these practices in their teaching. Students will go through their needs assessment or self-assessment routinely. And instead of doing it orally, where the document could be lost, instead of sending a document in a Word format, our teachers are sending the form, students are completing it, and that, that information is shared directly to um, a Google spreadsheet. Here we have an example of an assessment. So this is a rubric where a teacher can finish or create the rubric. Um, again, task-based learning, you have to give the or save assessment task results. And you have an option of taking this and exporting it to a digital world. Instead of creating paper-based documents, you would create digital versions of this that are housed online. Benefits, I can access this from any computer. If I didn't bring my USB drive to work one day, and I didn't have that handout, 
then I'd have to improvise quite quick, quickly on my lesson plan. But I have no need for this anymore. Everything's on the cloud. I access it from my computer at work. The students can access it from the computer lab. And my life has become moderately easier as a teacher. Here's one example of use of Google Drive, uh, Google Drive Docs. So what you would do is you would take your task and you can collaborative, collaboratively work on this task with a student synchronously. So I've taken an IKEA um, instructions for creating, I think it's a bookshelf, and the task is write the steps in, in your words. And I can see the student do it. The student then has immediate access to my feedback and my corrections. This is an example of file sharing. So now this used to be my portfolio, my sad, sad old little document. Um, but now my portfolio is online. And this is a, the, an example of how I can share drive resources with other people. So my teachers in my program have access to all of the training resources that have been created without me ever emailing them a single document. I don't have to email a PDF. I don't have to email 87 teachers a Word document. What I do is upload all of my resources to a Google Drive folder. Everyone has access to the folder. Whenever I upload a new document, they can see it automatically. Now I don't have to go through those administrative tasks that require a little bit more work and if I cut into all of those steps a little bit for each of the things that I do, at the end of the day, I've saved quite a bit of time. So that's administratively um, some of the benefits, but also the benefits for your students for Google Drive. Um, I'm just going to click through this, because this is my, this really is my philosophy. It's about working smarter. It's about taking the stress out of the routine things you do. So if you sit down practically and with a pen and paper, make a list of every single step it takes to do one task, such as email a student a handout. That involves a lot of different steps. It's about cutting that down so that you're doing the things in fewer steps more efficiently. And one way you can do this is with Google Calendar. And this is what I'm going to conclude with. So those of you who have Google Calendar, it's a nifty little tool. Our teachers have 20 students, potentially. And each student has a one-on-one -on -one instructional time, one-on-one -on -one instructional time with their student, with their teacher. Here in Google Calendar, I can share my calendar with different access permissions with anybody. So if I have my class schedule set up, I can share this calendar with my students and they can see when I am busy. So they can see the time that's blocked out. They can also see the time when I'm free. So it's easier to schedule. I've also used Google Calendar for timesheets. So teachers who are, in, who are engaged in um, additional tasks with the program where I have to chart the, their hours, we all collaborate on one calendar with the payroll department, and we can all see the hours that each of the teachers have um, completed towards a particular project. So I've used calendars for uh, scheduling classes, but also from the administrative perspective, I've used cal calendars to track payroll hours because we can all collaborate and work on one calendar. One thing about the calendars as well, concluding, is that you can add attachments. So if you have a student who has a class scheduled for 7 p.m. Saturday morning or 7 p.m. Saturday night, you can send them an invitation in your calendar attaching the lesson plan to that. You can send notification and reminders of the lesson. So it's Saturday at 2 p.m. Remind them to do the lesson by notification. And that message had the attached lesson plan embedded in it. So everything was done in one place. So the calendar, Gmail, Google Drive, 
YouTube. If anything, I hope that all of these options you were able to see from an outside perspective and want to immerse yourself in from an insider perspective. Um, I have nothing else that I can share with you today, but I do think that um, if you can explore options with Google, you will likely find benefit. I have a question from Tyson. Have you found resistance? Uh, no. Um, I think the, the, the hurdle for the staff that I use Google Calendar with, with regards to tracking of payroll hours, was training. So as long as I was explicit and clear on my instructions, then the um, additional work sort of flowed like water over a rock. The, the most time you spend, at least I've found with teachers, is in the training. Once that's, if it's done efficiently, then the practices um, can be embedded into their routine. It's, it's that initial hurdle of getting them there and training them on how to do it, and then the benefit comes from that. So that's, this, that's all for today's session. Um, I can take questions if you have any questions. I also um, encourage you to contact me if you want a copy of this, these slides. I will not send you a, P, a, P, um, a PowerPoint presentation. I'll send you a link to my Google Drive PowerPoint online. Um, but I'm happy to take questions if you have any at this time. No questions. Uh, maybe go back to that idea of the universe, that image of the universe. Don't get lost in it. Um, pick something. If you don't have a Google Drive account, try. If you don't have a Gmail account, go in and try. Don't lose that motivation, that momentum, and um, see if you can start embedding practices that are engaging, collaborative, and connected. I can't believe there are no questions. Absolutely. It's show by example. Tyson, I could not agree with you more. And everything I've talked about today, I share because I do. And I share, I've, I've shared it because I know it works. And it makes my life much easier. Thanks, Elena, for taking us behind the scenes. I know. I'm, 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 that's my middle name, Tsunami. <laughs> I, I do a lot in one hour. All right, no questions. Okay. Everyone is overwhelmed, or everyone is on the other tab trying to set up Google Accounts. I know, I know. And this is most people in the room today running away. No, leave me alone. Well, we have one more uh, session coming up in another minute. Thank all you right. Anna, so much. No problem. It was a pleasure meeting all of you this morning. I hope that you um, explore with success. So have a good day, everybody. You're very welcome. Thank you so much.